Christophe has studied American literature and he now teaches at Bordeaux III. His field of research was more specifically on 19th century literature and with Ambrose Beers he wrote more particularly on the fantastic. He then turned to cinema and wrote on horror films of the 70s, on Romero, Carpenter, as well as on westerns, Eastwood, Peking Path, particularly he worked on Deadwood, mm -hmm. and on journalism, he worked on Cold Blood, Midnight in the Garden, Wag the Dog. He's a member of the CERCIA, the Scholarly Society and the <coughs> Study of the English-Speaking <coughs> Cinema. Today, he's going to deal with El Santo's legacy. So this is a continuation of what we had previously. El Santo's legacy, looking for lucha libre in Colombian soap operas. Thank, thank you very much. Um, first, um, I'm sorry if I'm going to repeat some of the things that have been said today. I'll try to go faster on that. And I also want to think to thank uh, Carolina Abello, uh, with whom I worked for this presentation. And I'm sorry she's not here. But it's a, it's a work we, we did together. So, um, I'm going to start with Bart. Uh, once again, <laughs> whether enjoyed or criticized, the extreme nature of wrestling has been noted by anyone watching a, f a match, the most famous French critic speaking about these, of these uh, excessive shows being Roland Barthes. For Barthes, the relation, of, uh, the relation to the audience is vital, and this connection can only be something immediate, emotional, and based on the senses. But em Barthes' emphasis on the charivari, we mentioned it this morning, and the hurly-burly, uh, can also be found in Christophe Lamoureux's um, stress on the popular nature of wrestling as it took place in fairs initially. Such a tendency uh, links wrestling and the carnivalesque, and Bakhtin inevitably comes to mind, as we said this morning. Uh, not only he, uh, can we here refer to the obvious grotesque nature of this event in which the human is mixed with both the animal and the divine, but we can also consider the dialogic nature of this event, uh, which is a match, a show, a drama, a happening all in one. In a study on Mucha Libre, Heather Levi has indeed convincingly stressed that the voice of the technical, the, the good guy, is far from being the only voice to be heard then. Rudos, uh, ma bad guys, matter too, and so, da so do the spectators. So the racket of the arena could therefore be seen as an instance of beneficial heteroglossia. Just like Heather Levi, Henry Jenkins also sees wrestling as a hybrid form of sports and melodrama, uh, in his article, Never Trust a Snake. Jenkins presents wrestling as a lower form of tragedy where excess prevails and where the wrestlers' bodies are the externalizations of the audience's emotions, as Bart does in his seminal work. Both critics dif differ, however, for Bart implies some closure when dealing with a wrestling match, everything is, imme is then immediate and all over at the end of the game, while Jenkins insist on the continuity of the storylines from one match to another, all this mainly thanks to the role of the media and TV. Jenkins' stress on serialization is obviously quite useful when considering the part played by Lucio Libre within Pobre Strico, uh, the Colombian soap opera I will mention in the end. When trying to organize this work in progress, uh, I have been tempted to deal with uh, El Santo's pivotal role in the representation of Lucha Libre in Latin, America, uh, Latin American media, <coughs> before focusing more specifically <coughs> on this recent Colombian soap opera or telenovela. Uh, but it seemed to me uh, that the specificity of Lucha Libre had also to be tackled. That's why I've decided to organize my presentation in one, two, three parts. Thus, I will first deal with Lucha Libre in general in a part that I have called Unmasking Lucha Libre from American Conventions to Mexican Convictions. Then I will narrow my scope onto El Santo's filmography, going faster maybe, uh, taking one film as an example. Uh, and I called that part La Fiesta de Todos los Santos, or The Excessive Nature of El Santo's Lucha Libre. 
And finally, I will show the part played by uh, Lucio Libre um, in Pobre Slico in a part that I have entitled uh, Washing Lucio Libre Out in Colombian soap opera Pobre Slico. That's what I will do. So, uh, unmasking Lucio Libre. Um, obviously, here I want to simply to stress some characteristics that might be useful for the rest of the presentation, not everything. So the first thing to be said is that Lucha Libre comes from wrestling, which was imported in Mexico in 33, 1933. Yet Lucha Libre became popular and acquired its own characteristics quite rapidly. Globally speaking, Lucha Libre insists on what is spectacular even more than wrestling. Pure strength is of course also relied on, but acrobatics is crucial. And that is why, all in all, uh, luchadores might be less gigantic than the images we saw this morning of the, the American wrestlers. In order to promote the dramatic staging of its fights, Lucha Libre has more flexible rules when tag team matches are organized, with sometimes up to six luchadores on fighting on stage, and then chaos rules supreme. Speaking of tradition and modernity, I would like to allude to something uh, that could be developed at length in another paper, and we mentioned it already already today. Um, yeah, because in, in this work in progress, uh, it seemed to me that the image of masculinity um, that is conveyed by Lucio Libre slightly differs from that which can be found in the USA, and we saw this with El Santo before. Uh, indeed, as even Lieberman shows in his study Mask and Masculinity, uh, Lucha, Li Lucha Libre might be a way for Mexican and South American people to renegotiate masculinity. I won't go as far as to pretend that there is no machismo in, in Lucha Libre, far from that, but there seems to be some sort of renegotiation of the gender roles. And while the luchador must still be strong and honorable, if he's a technico, yet he might well turn this honorable conduct into a chivalrous, chivalrous one. El Santo is a good example uh, on this, uh, of this stress on romanticism. This relative open-mindedness can also be felt uh, in the Mexican society with the acknowledged existence of luchadoras and female wrestlings. Uh, one might say, yes, well, there are women wrestlers in the USA too, and we saw this uh, a while ago, um, but luchadoras are less termed, I think, in general, uh, are less turned into the, into the sexual object that female wrestlers tend to be in the USA and in the film we saw just before. Um, so here are examples of um, female wrestlers. Lastly, transsexual wrestling seems to be considered as a full part of the world of Lucha Libre. And then one speaks of exoticos for transsexual looks at luchadores. Lucha Libre has therefore evolved quite rapidly and sometimes rather drastically away from the American mold. And this evolution can be found in one prop that was also imported from the USA, and we have talked about it uh, uh, before, um, uh, a prop that took on its own colorful characteristics, going as far as to become the epitome of Lucha Libre nowadays, and I'm of course referring uh, to the mask and its different uses in Latin America. So in 1915, there, uh, in the USA, a wrestler Mort Henderson was indeed already known as the Masked Marvel. But what matters is to see how fast and fervently the luchadores masks were adopted by uh, the South American cultures. So pictures of just uh, luchadores with their masks on. Um, they were um, quickly adopted because they, perfectly, they were perfectly adapted to um, the ancestral beliefs of pre hispanic America. And so they instantly reached a symbolical status that might not have been that significant in North America. Unlike Hulk Hogan, who can be Hulk Hogan and Mr. America at the same time almost, masked luchadores stick to their unique identity till they lose it. But, well, they've got one identity. These masks are their identities and only their sons should be allowed to take, to take on this identity, as is the case with El Hijo del Santo or Blue, G Blue Demon Jr. Thus, even if the origin of those bright masks is not to be found in the Aztec ceremonies, still, uh, they can have been given such a symbolic, they have been given such a symbolical status uh, that they now have become an integral part 
of the South American traditions. The vitality of these beliefs also explain the fur explains the fervor that can be felt when a lucha de apuestas is organized. It's a fight in which the loser symbolically dies as he has to remove his masks, then facing public humiliation. Masked luchadores are part of the everyday life in Mexico and South America, and it is not ra rare to find some persons in Mexico who decide to gather lucha libre and the cause they want to fight for, it has been mentioned before. Of course, one may feel some irony in their stance sometimes, but their in involvement is real and cannot be questioned. Thus, examples, um, social, social activism enables some luchadores to be in the limelight. For example, Super Barrio uh, fights to protect Mexican workers' rights. Mr. Nibla, Mr. Fogg, is um, a social worker too. Uh, well, he's a social worker for disabled uh, <coughs> children. And we mentioned it this, him this morning, Fray Tormenta, Friar Storm, uh, is a Mexican priest who supports an orphanage thanks to Lucha Libre. And as we said this morning, this man is known also for um, uh, the source is for, to be the source of inspiration of these two films um, that have been mentioned this morning. Well, these films, especially the latter, uh, Natural Libre, are not known for their subtlety, but in a way, neither of them these films, gives the radical version of Frey Tormenta's real life, since that friar did not hesitate to wear his mask in his religious duty, as we saw on one of the pictures. Last but not least, the face of one of the most famous political leaders in Mexico would go totally unnoticed if it were not for his balaclava, his woolen hood. Subcomandante Marcos has indeed reached worldwide state fame, worldwide fame, thanks to his masked face. And Heather, Heather Levi interestingly connects the lives of the social luchadores with that of the political leader. In both cases, masks enable those men to reach some special status, some mythical status in a way. The mask is the element that will concentrate dramatic tension and convey some added value to the fight as far as symbolization goes. Lucha Libre can then be likened to magic, to rites meant to pave the way for a better society. And with the added aura of the luchador's mask, we may even then speak of a mystical experience. The notion of excess that Christophe Lamoureux associates to the conjuring, rites, conjuring rites of wrestling can easily be found in El Santo's career as a luchador and hero of photo novellas or actor. I will therefore concentrate on that excessive nature of the career of this uh, Enmascarado de Plata uh, in this second part. Um, so it took some time for Rodolfo Guzman Huerta to become El Santo. Before he had been, uh, he had been first uh, Rebuscador. Uh, Rebuscar in Spanish means uh, doing several odd jobs to, to make ends meet. When he started wrestling, he got different identities before that of El Santo, and he became El Santo in 42, as was said, uh, as a rudo. Um, right. The photonovelas, or historietas, were first published in the early 50s, and I took some pictures of the book that you uh, showed around. I, I had um, taken some sh shots of them. Um, so, um, these photonovelas were published in the early 50s by uh, Rosé Cruz, as you can see, and uh, in the mid-70s they were then published in Colombia till the end of, uh, in the late 80s. These photonovelas mixed all possible sensational topics. Santo fought against all kinds of enemies, gangsters, monsters, aliens, um, just examples. Um, the covers of these booklets are very colorful and they might remind us of the posters of the Hammer films or uh, of the horror films of Jess Franco or Mario Bava. Uh, the variety of themes alluded to by this writer of Bronx might also have, been, uh, have had some influence on Charles Burns when he created his El Borba. Uh, that's here next. Um, what is also worthy of note in the, in the hot hodgepodge of Santo's photonovelas is the diversity of techniques involved in the making of these adventures. The black and white images um, result from so some sort of collage 
in which can be found drawn panels, drawings, onto which are put still images and captions. So you've got very strange results, like these. It is also uh, possible to find a great variety of themes and monsters in El Santo's films. These films belong to what has been dubbed the Mexploitation films. They were part of the popular culture of the time in the 60s and 70s. They mix different sources, some cliches of the hor Hollywood horror films, as well as elements of lucha libre. Here again, the monstrosity of the told tales is felt twice, as the polymorphous aspect of these filmic objects cannot go unnoticed. Let's now focus on one film starred by El Santo, Santo y Blue Demon contra los Monstruos. Uh, the film is laden with a great variety of influences, just like in the historietas, uh, so these, these are the films, and uh, um, so here are the monstruos. Um, so just like uh, in the historietas, monsters of all kinds abound here in that one film. El Santo fights against no less than six monsters. At the same time, Frankenstein, Dracula, the werewolf, the mummy, the vampire woman, and the cyclop. We don't know why he's in the cyclops in here. Um, and all these mythical creatures are brought to life by Dr. Bruno Hadler, a mad scientist using a dwarf and a small alien with a huge brain as assistants, as well as some sturdy zombies. Um, but the film also... Uh, uh, the film is also a documentary film, since it starts with a 10-minute scene uh, in which we can first witness the fight of luchadoras and then that of Blue Demon with other luchadores. Later, the, films so here are the, the fight. Later, the film also becomes a musical film, since Santo and his girlfriend go to a restaurant where um, a dancing show takes place on stage for another five minutes. Examples, therefore, abound of the hybrid nature of the film. And as the examples show, we can note that El Santo is very much of a gentleman, since he considers luchadoras his equal, and since he also invites his girlfriend to a very refined place. At the beginning of the film, Santo is also shown quietly reading a newspaper at home. That scene could almost belong to the most classical, domestically inclined telenovela, and it proves, if needs be, that El Santo is not just a brutish fighter with no sensitivity nor any intellect. He can read. In his own way, um, El Santo is indeed a new version of the luchador, a hero with a heart who worries for his girlfriend's safety and who does not hesitate to stop his car so as to kiss her as they drive for a long time indeed, um, in a rural landscape. As for the storyline of El Santo's film, it is rather chaotic. For example, the central fight in the film turns out to be a absolute mayhem. The Rudo is Dracula himself, and soon all the monsters take part in the fight, while the audience is panic-stricken and run, runs all over the arena. If the initial fight of the film looked like a documentary, the one against the monsters is fictional and unruly, thereby echoing Roland Barthes' words according to which wrestling does not need some causation. The absence of mobile and logic is not to be lamented, which is a blessing as far as the structuring of El Santo's films are concerned. The repetitive aspect of some scenes may initiate some unrelenting structure akin to that of serialization. Thanks to this pattern, Santo can fight evil forces again and again, being each and every time beaten up and yet always winning at the, at the end, until the next episode. This cyclical structure may lead the transcendence of violence required may lead to sorry, the transcendence of violence required to reach some mythical status. We might also see the same scenes as the conjuring rites uh, meant to defeat violence in um, Christophe Lamour's opinion. The adventures of El Santo do feed these theories, and the luchador is the last bastion against evil forces. What is interesting in our film here is that even if Santos knows how to use science, he is not to be sided with science. Pure science is the realm of Dr. Bruno Hadler, the, ma the mad scientist. Pure science implies the notion of order, of cleanliness. It implies an adoration of its theorems and that is almost religious. 
The, this worshipping of science by the villain is then poles apart with Santo's healthy physicality, and the luchador's resilience then appears rather close to the notion of magic. Santo's buoyancy is on the side of magic, of rituals, of good rituals, that enable people to go on living and enjoying life despite the cold criteria of a life ruled by science. To some extent, this opposition between cold religion and warm magic can also be felt in Pobrez Rico, where science is then replaced by merciless economic theories. Indeed, in the Colombian telenovela, the family of the luchador is a healthy one, even if unruly, and it is also faced to inhuman economic theories that tend to crush man's vitality. To face these economic hardships, Don Carlos, the head of the family and ex-luchador, relies on traditions and on what Lucha Libre taught him. But despite his attempt at traditional popular culture uh, and Lucha Libre, um, not, sorry, despite his, his attempt, traditional uh, popular culture and Lucha Libre won't be strong enough to fight <coughs> the growing in standardization entailed by today's economy. And so my last part is about Torres Rico. Washing, uh, washing Lucha Libre out in this soap opera. Pobre Rico is a Colombian telenovela, as I said, that was aired on private network last year, till January th the 13, 2013. That's just ended. There, uh, so here is the plot in a very few words. It is based on the lives of two families, the rich one, the Rico family, and the poor one, the Siachoque family. At the beginning of the story, the Rico lose everything and they are forced to live in a poor area of Bogota. Uh, for some reason, they are forced to share the house of the Siachoque and the two families having then to adapt to each other. As in all soap operas, there are many characters, but the one here worthy of note of, of our interest is Don Carlos Siachoque. Um, this retired luchador was then called El Gladiator uh, and he is an admirer of El Centro. He is dependable, obviously very strong, physically speaking, but is also pictured as a highly sensitive man who cries easily. He now owns a little restaurant, El Coliseo Roma, uh, that can be used as a wrestling arena or as a popular music concert venue at night. Just like with El Santo's beginning, uh, Don Carlos and his family take part in the Ribusque Cotidiano in the hunt for little jobs to survive. As for the ex luchador's tears, they are only the, the externalization of the feelings El Santo expressed for Gloria, the girl he loved. El Gladiator could then be the modern version of El Santo fighting. So here is El Gladiator, by the way. Um, El Gladiator, so uh, fighting uh, for justice against what is economically <coughs> wrong in Bogota. That is why, although of secondary importance in the telenovela, the audience very well accepted this character, whose name, besides, uh, also recalls the popular roots of uh, Colombian culture. Um, Sacchoque is a village in, Bo Bo in the department of uh, Bo Boyaca, in the middle of the country, uh, before the Spanish. But of course, this being said, we won't go as far as saying that Pobre Rico is a telenovela on Lucha Libre. It is first and foremost a telenovela meant to be aired on, in prime time. And then, when serialization turns into mass production, the gist of the series might well become endangered. There is a risk indeed that the aura of the luchador's mask might be affected, the mask losing its mythical status and being turned into a cheap exotic item in the globalized consumer society, a cool thing to wear for the birthday of a party buddy. Um, well, Don Carlos, the representative of values, the one who facilitates takes care uh, of his collection of masks, seems indeed unable to convince his own son, a reggaeton singer, that Lucha Libre has a future. Father and son will meet, however, in the final wedding which takes place in Don Carlos Coliseum and which gathers um, Lucha Libre and reggaeton. You've got both, a concert and a show, a Lucha Libre show. Tradition and modernity can therefore live together, the film says, uh, the, the, the telenovela says. In Pobres Rico, everyone can eventually get the best of both worlds, despite all the problems that are faced throughout all the episodes. The message is optimistic in that soap opera, which colors the, use, the usual melodramatic mode of telenovelas with element of the comedy. 
To conclude more generally about the melodrama, we can say that it has be always be been very much appreciated and studied in Latin America. For, from a distance, all Latin America telenovelas look the, the same. However, in his thorough study on these soap operas, Jesus Martin Barbero stresses some important differences. From the mid-80s to the late 90s, Colombian soap operas differed from the traditional Mexican and Venezuelan melodramas as they were more focused on the representation of national customs, Colombian customs. Nowadays, however, most soap operas are sponsored by transnational, transnational channels whose purpose is to create parameters that lead to an audiovisually unified Latin America, and Pobras Rico cannot avoid that tendency as it deals with the melodrama and Lucha Libre. Carlos Monsivais shows uh, that in Mexico and in Colombia, urban popular culture emerges from the celebration of the grotesque with all its excesses like the aesthetics of bad taste, the use of rude language, with the fascination for physically risky activities like wrestling, lucha libre, or bullfighting. For him, for Monsivais, the cultural industry in Latin America will therefore copy those cliches of popular culture with the sole purpose of reaching a fake notion of identity. Pobres Rico is no exception. Pobres Rico thus conflates stero stereotypical elements of the popular culture, melodrama, lucha libre, with elements of high culture, the opera, with formulaic elements of, from the mainstream, n uh, nice cars and wealth, and also with elements uh, newly absorbed and digested by the mainstream, like the trendy reggaeton or the gothic subcultures. The result of this mixture is a hackneyed melodramatic plot in which uh, a poor girl falls in love with a rich boy. Um, and the edifying message, this uh, edi edifying message uh, is that the rich should always become aware that it is difficult to be poor. These ideas are anything but original, and they can be found in many other telenovelas whose titles even sound similar. So here are examples of other telenovelas in, in Colombia. Pobres Pablo, Niños Ricos, Pobres Padres, or even in Mexico, Los Ricos también lloran, the rich also cry. With such a mollifying message, telenovelas are obviously the flag bearers of the uh, standardized sentimentalism that is quite foreign to the chaotic world of Lucha Libre. Nestor Garcia Canclini and Carlos Monsivais have studied the role of the cultural industry over the masses, paying particular attention to the melodrama. For them, the world evolution towards globalization has favored the development of these programs that tend to eradicate uh, the trace of tradition and singularity. According to Monsivais, the project of the hegemonic cultural industry consists in creating a massive, now mainstream, culture which uproots traditions as much as it can. The critic adds, however, that the masses are not just passive receivers. In fact, they participate in the exchange by reacting more or less favor favorably to what is provided. By doing so, they may influence creation of the standard uh, of the standardized products to come, to a certain extent. So, this slight note of optimism can also be backed by the reactions of the audience and of TV reviewers who have all stressed that despite its obvious lack of originality, Pobre Rico manages to draw a somewhat more interesting portrait of the protagonists belonging to the Colombian lower class. And Don Carlos, El Gladiator, with his somewhat superseded sense of justice, has undoubtedly been one of the most well-liked protagonists of that short-lived telenovela. Hoping that his charisma and his code of honor might outlive him, we may then conclude in uh, saying loud, La lucha continua.